Uh, friends and colleagues, welcome to the 39th webinar of the 50 webinar series Habitat Forum and many partners are hosting together. As you know, we started in June last year and hope to complete the first set by February 20, 2021. Today's uh, webinar is special. It is on what should Indian students of architecture be concerned about. It is special for many reasons. The first is that it is in partnership with NASA, National Association of Students of Architecture. And four out of seven panelists today are students, they are majority. They're either students or those who have just graduated being students. I'm glad we're going to hear their views and perspectives on their education, also how they see architecture practice. It is not always that we hear students on such matters and also take them seriously. So this is an important opportunity. The second reason why it is special is that, that this dialogue is happening in a series on rethinking Indian city. It is on urbanization and finding ways to meeting the daunting urban challenge creativity. The series is addressed to and is platform for multiple stakeholders that include urban planners, administrators, activists, professionals, academic researchers, ordinary citizens, even slum dwellers. Architects are no small stakeholders in shaping India's cities. They have a big role to play. And I just wrote to someone last week that is no coincidence that architect Charles Correa headed the first and the only national commission on urbanization set up in independent India. And that commission, that is National Commission on Urbanization was a watershed moment in India's urban journey. The third point that makes this webinar special is the composition of the panel. It's a healthy combination of youth and experience, aspiration and achievement, and brings together dreamers and people who have achieved practically. This is a healthy balance for the dialogue. It's also a healthy dialogue balance in search of new solutions, approaches, and strategies to meeting the urban challenge. We are fortunate that Prem Chandakavakar, Habib Saab, and Bindaji have found time for this dialogue, as we know, they are all very, very special. Last year was special year for me in terms of my association with NASA. I was part of their three major events, address their journal convention, which had over 2000 students in Gontur Vijayawada. Then Prem and I were given an opportunity to present Pune Declaration on architecture practice and education in NASA's yearly convention in Bangalore. And most importantly, they asked me to be a moderator of their annual NASA competition. Over 470 students participated. It had a 50 member jury. They made over 900 minutes of video and about 2000 drawings of villages. The theme of the competition was social production of a rural habitat. And as you know, that is not an easy subject to work on. They say students and young architects are not interested in villages. I was surprised and deeply impressed 
by the enthusiasm, quality of work. It is time we give new challenges to our students, to our young people. They are ready and equipped. Our education needs to be rethought, reorganized, and restructured so that they have these challenges. Having introduced uh, this webinar briefly, I hand over this to Aditya for introduction of NASA and subsequently to Prem to conduct the webinar. Thank you very much. Aditya? Yeah. Good evening, everyone. I'm Aditya Jaiswal, Zone Percent Zone 3 from NASA India. So basically, I'll brief you about the association, what it is, and what we have been trying to do, and how we keep the students engaged in it. And last but not the least, how pandemic has hit us and how we have changed the methods of handling everything. So what we say in the past, the present, and the future of Indian architecture, we quote it as NASA India. Because NASA India was established in 1957, 10 years ago after the independence, when there were seven colleges associated to it. Today, NASA India is the largest student body organization with its participation from over 300 colleges across India and the globe. A democratic body for undergraduate students from the architecture. NASA India has always strived for students' empowerment through activities like various events, conventions, seminars, workshops, competitions, trophies, and thus creating a platform where they can engage students across the country through both online and offline modes. So it's a diverse collaboration, a national platform which strives to bridge the gap between the professionals and uh, the students, raising their voice and opinions with like issues concerning the students' community and help them to stage it, thus boasting a very vibrant leadership platform. And like various uh, events, like where uh, students get an opportunity to uh, bring their projects to a, a practical practical thing where they can execute it. For example, through the grants program or the little mentorship program where the professionals are directly guiding or uh, teaching the students over various topics. So these were the, some things like which are taken up this year and talking about the new normal, how like we, we can imagine architecture field to be done in an online mode while you're practicing this for over past, I don't know how many years through pen, pencil, various softwares, but there was gradual shift over the online medium. So like various juries were happened on over an e juries basically what we called so trophies the competition design competitions all were shifted to the online types then uh, the webinar seminars workshop which help a student to have a holistic development and uh, various things for example on uh, the instagram handle we have part chalas like which give out the knowledge about various topics and uh, new terms which students can explore so yeah, these are the online platform which we have started and uh, imparting knowledge on that. So there's a platform where students can come together and interact with the professionals in the field out there. So this was the brief description about NASA India. Now I would like Prem sir to take over. Thank you. Okay, thank you Aditya and Kirti. Uh, it's great to have this discussion today uh, because it's oriented towards the younger, uh, younger colleagues, uh, we have six panelists out of whom there we have two students, two young professionals and two gray haired people like me. And uh, just to articulate some concerns we first uh, uh, laid out when we were defining this topic, uh, the Council of Architecture on their website say there are 469 colleges uh, sanctioned to offer BR degrees with an allowed intake of 24, about 24,000 students a year. So even if all colleges are not operating at full strength and there is some dropout, that will mean somewhere around 20,000 architects graduating every year. The current number of registered architects as per Council of Architecture is uh, 1,6,000, somewhere in that region, a little over a lakh, which means that the number of architectural practices is likely to be less than 20,000. So how will 20,000 students per year be placed for the mandatory internships that are part of their degree program? Where will they find jobs? Clearly we need to define some alternative uh, forms, paradigms and geographies of practice. Otherwise uh, the, uh, these students are likely to hit a crisis. And I think it's interesting that our two young professionals here today don't follow 
the conventional paradigms in, in the way they are charting their careers. Uh, on top of this, there are other concerns. Once they graduate, there is no forum to, that really represents the interests of young architects. The only national forum is Indian Institute of Architects and less than one third of uh, council registered architects are members and a vast majority of those members are over the age of 50. So young architects are not joining IIA because they do not see it as a forum useful to their concerns. Uh, many people talk about problems with the uh, quality of uh, how uh, education is regulated, that it is driven by a minimum standards checklist when it really should be provoking excellence. There are no regulatory standards for assessing faculty excellence in teaching research or practice other than a superficial counting of degrees and years of experience. And even this regulatory architecture is going to change radically with the new education policy declared by the government. And there is no uh, clarity of how we are going to move to this new system. And we also have a global problem of architectural education that is uh, that colleges elsewhere face and uh, is also found in India that it still follows an outdated mode oriented towards the architect as a heroic innovator of aesthetic form. Uh, not very well connected to the socio-cultural, ecological, and transcendental dimensions of architecture. So education offers little guidance on how to confront the major issues of our day. Climate change, a degrading urbanism and rural areas in terms of both ecology and quality of life, a rural sector that has negligible access to architecture and planning services, increasing inequality and marginalization in our settlements, and mainstream paradigms of planning that are blind to the informal sector that provides the majority of jobs in housing. But there is hope that radical change can happen and this lever is in the demographics, very specifically the young. With 20,000 graduates per year, those who are currently in college will become the dominant group in the profession over the next decade. And if they organize, they can set the agenda for how the profession of architecture reshapes itself. To do this, they need to start thinking and collectively thinking about what they should be concerned about and what kind of agenda uh, they wish to chart. And this dialogue we're having today is looked at one, as one small step in that process. So the way we will format the evening is uh, we will first ask each of our panelists and we'll start from the youngest moving upwards in age. I don't go strictly in age order, but roughly. Uh, so, so we will do that for about half an hour. Then, then uh, we'll have a discussion for about 40 minutes of uh, between the panelists where we'll take some of the issues that have come up in the individual presentations and in some of the concerns I have articulated. And I wish to stress that whatever I have articulated so far is not an exhaustive list. And we really need to listen to the young today to find out what their concerns are. And then finally, we'll have about half an hour of open question and answer. And for that, I request all participants to post their questions in the Q&A box. Uh, please, please do not post it in the chat box because we have the speaker bios and all that coming up there and your questions will get lost. So please post them in the Q&A box. Some the panelists might choose to answer, uh, sort of type their answers and address them. And some we will see how we can bring them into the discussion that we have at the end. So thank you. And uh, I will now uh, invite the speakers. And the first uh, presentation is actually going to be a joint presentation. Uh, between our two youngest panelists, Harish Karthik Vijay and Abhigna B. Harish is a member of the, they're both members of the editorial team of NASA. Uh, Harish is a fifth semester student at BMS College. Uh, he has varied interests going across design discourse, emerging trends and technologies in architecture, computational and procedural approaches to design fiction, which sounds very intriguing. And he has a strong interest in writing on architecture, believing this has, is as much architecture as building spaces. Abhigna uh, hails from the educational hub Dharwad in Karnataka and is a seventh semester student at KLE College. Uh, she believes, takes a very holistic attitude towards life, believing in living through experiences 
connecting humans, nature, and everything. And she interestingly aspires to seek and live through two perceptions, being in the moment and in retrospection. So over to you, Harish and Abhigna. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. So before we start the presentation, we would like to extend the sincerest of gratitude from our end for giving us this opportunity uh, to Indian Habitat Forum to place our concerns as we right now represent the student body altogether. So we'll start the presentation. Yes. Is it visible? Yes, yes, it is. We could start, shall we? Yeah, please start. Yeah, so we, uh, we as being part of the editorial team of NASA India have took up uh, an exhaustive research on what are the typical issues that a, an architecture student right now at this age and time feels and what are the potential problems one might encounter upon graduation and an internship. So this is more or less a summary of the research that we have put together over the past year. So we have titled it Envisioning a Better Learning Process in the Design Discourse as we believe that uh, design learning and architecture just doesn't stop with the university education, but continues throughout because we are going to be architects. So to the next slide. What uh, what we are, we commonly talk about is the bridging the gap between the students and the profession. So we call this a disconnect between the students and profession. Uh, I would like to question the students, uh, the attendees mostly. Oh, that how often do we get a chance to interact with a practicing architect? Uh, I living in a town wherein there are fever architects and uh, there is schooling happening uh, parallel to profession. We do not interact a lot with architects. This is where uh, there is a gap between the students and the profession. So we are uh, we know no, uh, we have a lot of knowledge, but uh, we do not know how to use it or how to. Uh, inculcate that in practice. And uh, one more thing is that uh, as students, uh, I feel we are not motivated enough uh, uh, to go and look at the world outside. We are uh, just sitting here in a room thinking we can learn architecture, but real architecture starts out and starts outside the classroom. So I would like to question, when was the last time one of us volunteered to visit and observe a construction site? And uh, the last one is that uh, we talk of contemporary architects, we talk about the masters, but it's uh, very less that we connect to architects in our, our city. So one of, the, one of the third questions, uh, what we uh, asked the students was that, try naming 10 architects in your city. Did so, the slide change? Yes, yes, it did. So moving on to the next notion that we wanted to discuss here, this is about representation. So in the document that was put together by architect Prem, there was a question as to why multiple, I mean, many young professionals and recent graduates hesitate to join an institution as the IIA. So to the next slide. So what, is the, the typical mindset of people who are students right now and recent graduates, I think would be that we believe that the future of architecture and design will not just be architects doing design, display it to other architects and get the job done. We believe that the future would be multidisciplinary. It wouldn't be just architecture uh, wherein designers happen to extend their conversations with other designers, but rather with 
the people because they are the ultimate stakeholders that we designed for so it is not just architecture alone but rather the design discourse is very diverse that there are so many multiple domains within the architecture uh, and the design uh, domain itself so moving on to scattered career choices yeah uh, so uh, we envision a multidisciplinary uh, career choice in architecture not all of the uh, back, uh, graduates want to be an architect one of us wants to be a photographer uh, another wants to be an artist uh, somebody else wants to be a writer so this is where our career choices get scattered and we do not come together uh, come into one place as young architects Uh, another point uh, why we do not come together is that we have been taught to work individually in terms of uh, documentation site visits we do it together but as students uh, we are not taught to uh, design together as a collective and collaborative expression we do not have uh, diversified perspectives when it comes to designing we stick to our individual opinions i think this is what has to change in terms of learning design so this is one more thing so as uh, as abhigna just quoted uh, this is what exactly happens in a design studio we are taught to work individually whereas in practice it hardly happens nobody takes up a project single handedly and delivers it ultimately it all happens in a group it is not just architects collaborating with other architects but rather with interior designers furniture designers engineers consultants there are a lot of other stakeholders uh, whom we collaborate with and then deliver a project but whereas the same thing doesn't translate exactly the same in our design classrooms we are taught to work individually we are just advised to learn from each other's design but we never design together so where is the collaboration component here is a question that we would like to put forward here so multiple people are supposed to work on a single design project only then do we get to exchange our perspectives with each other uh, so this is something that design school seems to have put students as a downside by not equipping us with the necessary skills to develop design projects as a group so architect chris prest states and i quote him here the future is in collaboration and trying to connect to people outside our industry so one more thing that has taken up uh, a bit of flow during the recent times is the question as to why exactly we we put forward our design deliberations to just other architects whereas it is to the people that we designed for so there was this competition that was organized from the government of uganda wherein architects were supposed to design a community a settlement for a, for a depressed people who were displaced because of an internal conflict so what happened was that it was not just other architects who were judging the kind of intervention that they that was going to happen in that rural area but rather the people itself so only if we taken the uh, views and perspectives of the actual people that we design for could we make sure that our design is going towards the right direction there is no point in creating uh, an interesting form or an aesthetic when people couldn't habit in the spaces that we create so this is one more thing that we wanted to put together uh, to the next slide can you see this slide yes yes i can okay will you start off uh, no you can start okay so i would like to bring in a bit of introduction to the homogeneity and the heterogeneity in terms of design education so we all know that we live in a country that has more than a billion people with a million customs and traditions that are so very diverse from each other plus the architectural expressions of each of our regions is equally unique in a scenario as this we do not right now have a very successful contemporary school of thought an avant-garde school of thought that tries to take pride in our built forms and push them to be more relevant to our times as a result of a homogenized curriculum most 
universities and architecture schools follow a similar pattern of subjects with a little bit of variation the changes between universities whereas the possibilities for a country as india are a lot more so i would like to state a fair example here in a small nation as germany the kinds of architecture and design schools that are seen are very much varied so there is a school called the stadel schule architecture class in frankfurt which operates within an art school so the people who also graduate as architects explore architecture only as a form of artistic expression exploring and pushing boundaries through domains like speculative design and theory alongside in the same country we have schools like the university of stuttgart which is very much technically inclined similarly other schools explore architecture and design as a medium to solve design problems with respect to space and thus the diversity of architecture professionals in a country as small as germany is very huge if only we had similar diversified schools of thought here could we have student architects who are each able to think and perceive things differently in their own ways so the one thing that we are of we are concerned about is that we are as uh, architect prem had mentioned each year 20000 plus the architecture graduates come out into the industry to get placed for internships in the 20000 odd firms imagine if at all we each had graduates coming from art based architecture schools technically inclined architecture schools and design based architecture schools coming together into a studio to work so the diversity in such studio practices would be a lot more so this was something uh, this is something we think is required here rather than us following a homogenized pattern of curriculum where everyone learns more or less the same thing we could diversify and move towards a more heterogeneous design discourse wherein each of us has a unique component from ourselves to contribute to the design discourse on the whole so hence we say coexistence learning from each other and accepting change are something that is of utmost requirement today i would like to add upon this uh, there is a digital divide that has been created due to the pandemic uh, the ones who are uh, tech savvy have upgraded themselves into learning new softwares new technologies whereas uh, the ones that are not used to adapting themselves to new technology have taken a back seat uh, this way uh, there is a digital divide that is been created and education has become a little difficult in architecture schools so uh, this is that time when we have to coexist the professors have to learn the use of technology through students and the students have to adapt to the change and that's how we'll keep uh, learning from each other and grow so we would like to end our presentation with this final quote here which is also a motto that is put forward from nasa india can we dream of a utopian indian architecture with all these notions realized so thank you we would again express our gratitude for giving us this opportunity here to put forward the concerns that architecture students of the contemporary times have Okay, thank you, uh, uh, Harish and Abhigna. Uh, we now move on to Hamza Abdullah, who is an architect and alumnus of Jamia Millia Islamia in Delhi. He is presently an India Smart Cities Fellow at the Smart Cities Mission, Ministry of Housing and Urban Affairs. His interests are in the fields of urban planning and policy, especially in the areas of mobility, informality, and citizen engagement. He has published research on these themes and intends to do further work on how urban and regional planning can acknowledge informal communities. He is a co-founder of an interesting organization, the Multilog Collective, an organization organization that works on and organizes events on the themes of urban dialogue, public outreach, and creative experimentation. Over to you, Hamza. thank you so much prem sir for the wonderful uh, introduction so uh, i will start uh, my discussion 
uh, with the argument that uh, with the, the population that the population of india is approaching uh, the 1.3 billion mark and the challenges towards sustainable urban development require uh, more informed decision making by the built environment professionals in uh, planning designing and developing the cities for the future uh, today we all know that the conventional design education is simply not enough to solve these complex urban challenges and the solutions must arrive through interdisciplinary practices so uh, i have had a discussion with some of my peers and juniors for the sake of this webinar uh, and i feel there are four primary concerns that uh, i will talk about here today uh, and these four concerns are you know uh, the first is how to incentivize uh, the students how to inspire them then how to inform them and then how to innovate together so uh, i'll start with the first one which is uh, how to incentivize uh, incentivizing is needed for students to take up architecture as a preferred and fulfilling career choice uh, and it can happen through through uh, curated schooling or the choice based credit system as envisioned in the national education policy 2020 uh, but my concern is how will this be achieved will empathy play, play a role in determining these out these choices uh what will these choices be uh, the national ambitions the local aspirations or the socio economic challenges that we face as a country and how will this empathy be developed in the students uh, another thing is uh, that one more thing that is needed to incentivize the students uh, to take up architecture as a profession is to make architectural education accessible to all we know that architectural education skews in favor of those with privilege of wealth gender and health etc so the question is as to how to enable students from all walks of life to devote their attention to finding creative excellence instead of worrying about how ridiculously low amounts of salary that the free market has to offer so uh, with this i move to my next concern which is how to inspire how to inspire these students Uh, we know that today almost 50% of all population in major indian cities lives in slums and most of the streets we see and public spaces they remain exclusionary disused and even misused so i want to ask them, if this is a demand not good enough then what it is and then how do we connect the supply of architects with the demand that is already there in our in our public realm is the top down approach of creating more job opportunities in this regard enough if not why don't we look at the bottom up approach where we allow the learners to be the change makers activists and advocates for the change they want to see through collaborative learning and entrepreneurship in which every student could find his or her calling and be sensitized towards his areas of interest and work to bring the change he or she desires often mentorship from the seniors and a strong strong alumni network in this regard it can go a long way in enabling peer learning and it can also trigger inspiration so that's how we inspire students and uh, then the question is can we create a standard to enable this across the institutions so that every student is inspired to make change uh then the third concern is how to inform we know that architects shape the way we live and interact with the built environment how can we leverage newer technology and data to inform our students make better design decisions this is one question that i have also the national education policy advocates for elimination of rote learning but to achieve that we'll have to connect the students with the industrial practices and grassroots organizations more uh the current par paradigms uh put a barrier in the way a fresh graduate envisions his or her career with many students uninformed of all the possibilities to work in different domains of design and planning uh the economics of the profession uh and the ethics of working as well so the question here is the concern here is how to inculcate these virtues in the graduates can we introduce design thinking in our curriculum so that the students are well equipped to carve out their own career trajectories and solve some of the pressing built environment issues of our country that's also one question that arises 
this leads me to my fourth concern which is uh, how to innovate uh, with uh, technological advancements every new day there is newer media new software and technology that is innovating the design process such as the machine learning artificial intelligence all of it is here and it is now the iot is expanding very fast so the the technology is innovating itself so how do we keep up how do we include all of this in the architectural curriculum and also provide the required infrastructure for the same as we clearly know our future appears to be digital and we have to prepare now next uh, how to establish a global connect and learn from the best best practices of the developed world while also working with our indigenous knowledge is also a virtue to be witnessed in the architectural education if we want the architect to be the innovators and torch bearers of the change that we want them to be lastly uh, it all comes down to investments in the architectural education or education in general with the ongoing covid 19 crisis will india spend enough on its, on its education budget which is around 3% of the gdp right now uh, the, new, the the nap envisages these changes to happen in education in another 9 years or so but do we have enough time and resources to achieve that is my last question and with this i conclude uh, uh, my points uh, thank you so much uh, thank you hamza uh, that was interesting uh, we move to our next speaker who's sagar tulshan who's an architect and entrepreneur with an interesting portfolio of careers he has worked with venkatraman associates Uh, in bangalore taking a lead on design communication architecture and urbanism including the well known church street redevelopment project he is a partner at ru studio an indo european collective with a presence in india ireland and finland devoted to contextual strategic responsive and thoughtful architecture He is the founder of an international collaborative, the Open Box Project, exploring architecture and design through tactical urban interventions, research and outreach programs, and notable projects. He is also the co-founder of Portal Frame, a location intelligence startup that creates actionable insights from urban data. His academic work and lectures have been widely published. and besides architecture he has a keen interest and works on design photography and film making so with that over to you sagar thank you so much um sorry in 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 the fashion of a true uh, seminar i'm having some issues with my video so i'm just going to go and and continue it, though um i'm going to share my screen quickly um let me know once you can see my screen yeah yeah we can see see so what i essentially done is i just wanted to uh zoom in a little bit and not uh, essentially uh talk of the uh, on a superficial level about um uh, both architect what what students go through in school of architecture and through practice so i thought i'll try and zoom in a little bit and and uh, think of concerns uh, at the grassroots level so uh, try to define that as a simple commentary and running notes uh, so first when it comes to school of architecture i think three things that were clearly a concern uh, were first of all course quality uh, the internships and uh, how do we make sure that we are ready for the industry right we have the right skills uh, to start working uh, and first with course quality i think it's clear that there's a dilution in the quality of education in general now the question is is it is this because of uh, the number of uh, univer- schools of architecture is it because there's a lack of experience uh, professors in these schools or is it just the system in general that is failing right and the second is uh, for me which is most interesting is is the essence of out of classroom education which has at least in my case always proven to be a huge value add uh, on top of what i've learned in the classroom in the studio right examples like nasa and competitions that we participated in external workshops uh, programs cross border programs with other colleges or other countries uh, this has always been uh, one of the best learning experiences for me as an architecture student but the problem and the question that i have there is how do you measure this and is it even tangible 
to measure out of classroom education and its role to play in architecture, especially in architecture. In, in my own example, I think uh, the student council at Ramaya, MS Ramaya, where I studied in Bangalore, uh, the National Association of Students of Architecture played big roles in shaping my uh, design process, my uh, individuality in architecture, et cetera, right? Um, construction workshops that we've done across um, NASA across uh, the European Architecture Students Assembly uh, helped us translate what was happening in the studio really well to an, an actual construction site and what it meant to do work at one one is to one scale. Just quick examples of that. Now, I think uh, in, when I spoke to a bunch of my uh, colleagues and and my friends and and students that I've been uh, talking to, I think internships were one of the biggest concerns. Uh, first, of course, is the exploit, the sense of exploitation that uh, students tend to go through. Uh, what that means also is something that we should discuss. Uh, second is, of course, the lack of compensation and unpaid internships. Now, I'm not sure what the answer to this is, but uh, I'm and also not sure if that, that is a systemic change that we're talking about. But clearly, that is a problem that uh, our students are dealing with. Uh, coming to the sense of solution for this problem, I uh, one way to look at it is, is do we create a general framework for internship pro programs from the practice instead of creating them uh, from the colleges, right? Do we create a framework that practices can adopt as a general norm across the board? And if, uh, if you run a practice, there is an internship program framework that you can just adopt and execute. Um, how do you compensate uh, our interns? Do we have a minimum wage system? How does that work? And uh, is there a way to institutionalize a central system for internships, either through um, a regulatory body like CUA or a representative body like IA? Uh, that is something interesting that I would like to discuss. Next is, of course, the industry ready skills, right? Uh, I, I, I think we tend to think of the architect always as, or we used to tend to think of the architect as the master craftsman, but uh, buildings are increasingly becoming more and more complex. And I think like Harish mentioned, this, it, it hasn't, it has been more co collaboration than ever. And uh, people are, ten, you, you need to find your specialization or your niche within this complex web of skills that you need to have. So how do you find yourself in, in you know, these niches and these specialities that you can have as an architect? Where do you even place yourself? And even if you want to be a generalist, how do you become a generalist in architecture, right? Uh, that's a question that is very interesting to me uh, these days. Uh, Next is, of course, as a young architect, I, uh, oh, yeah. I think uh, there's a clear lack of opportunities. That's clearly the, uh, as architect Prem spoke about, there's a gap between the number of opportunities that are available and the uh, number of uh, graduates that we are churning out every year. I think there's a problem with the fair compensation model. We'd not, we, uh, we've always suffered from a fair compensation in the industry. There's a lack of concern for the environment. I've noticed that uh, a lot of us graduate and then co conveniently tend to forget that uh, architecture has, has a responsibility towards climate action, responsibility towards the environment, um, and tend to go into this rabbit hole of, okay, how do I make money? Because I need to survive as an architect. And then um, looking at architect, architecture as a service for all, uh, I also know that, I also understand that young architects tend to go, uh, tend to look for, clients who can afford to build, clients who can afford architecture and tends to become a service that is looked at uh, as, as a luxury. So how do we solve for that? Uh, for compensation, I think there's a definitely a standard compensation framework which is required for architecture. Um, for this lack of concern of environment, I think instead of just looking at incentives and certifications for buildings and tax breaks for buildings and clients, we should also look for incentives to make uh, uh, architects more, uh, you know, uh, to make them have um, more work done on, on making their buildings eco-friendly. And these incent incentives to, should also target architects instead of our clients. Now, uh, just a quick reference to Maslow's pyramid of needs. Um, he, sp he spoke about how a general human being goes through these needs uh, through their life. And, uh, but I think as, as owners of practices, as professional architects, we, we tend to think of our students and our interns as uh, living the opposite. And we expect them to uh, self-actualize first. And I think this, this, we tend to think that if we romanticize with this exploitation of 
uh, architecture students and interns enough, we can pass it off as passion for the field, but that's not true. And we should not forget that uh, we're human beings after all. Uh, yeah, and that's how I would like to end. Thank you. Okay, thank you, uh, Sagar. Uh, we now move to the interesting transition in our discussion where we shift from the youngsters to the oldies. And uh, our next speaker will be Brinda Somaya, who is uh, principal architect at Somaya in Kalapa, Mumbai. Uh, she's an architect and urban conservationist and her firm is, she co-founded co in 1978, they're based in Mumbai. Uh, she has won numerous international and national awards. A recent one being the UNESCO Asia Pacific Award of Distinction for Cultural Heritage Conservation for the restoration and upgradation of the historic Louis Kahn buildings at the Indian Institute of Management, Ahmedabad. And uh, since that has been a subject that has been in the news recently, I have to qualify that it's a subject that's off limits in today's discussion. Uh, Brinda has contractual uh, uh, limitations on what she's uh, able to speak about publicly, and we should respect that. Uh, Brinda is a recipient of the Barbara Mahatre Gold Medal for Lifetime Achievement from the Indian Institute of Architects. Uh, she has a range of notable projects uh, which have been profiled in the book Brinda Somaya Works and Continuities, published by Mappin and the Hekar Foundation. Uh, she is the recipient of an honorary doctorate from our Alma Mater Smith College in the US. And she is the chairperson of the Board of Governors School of Planning and Architecture, Vijaywada. Uh, she is a member of the board of the Lafarge Holson Foundation for Sustainable Construction, based in Zurich, Switzerland, and is presently the A.D. White Professor of Ar Professor at Large at Cornell University, USA. Over to you, Brinda. Thank you, Prem. Thank you, Kirti, for this invitation. And uh, of course, uh, Habib as well, and all you young students. So it was very interesting listening to all of you. But what I would like to do would be just to give uh, some general points before I'm sure in the panel discussion, we will be going into the individual points that all of you have brought up. So our, uh, ex our late president, Dr. Radha Krishnan, who was our president from 1962 to 1967 said, in order to be complete, education must be humane. It must include not only the training of the intellect, but also the refinement of the heart and the discipline of the spirit. And this is what I believe an architect is all about. And that is why it is such a wonderful and unique profession. He also said teachers should be the best minds in the country, talking about education, and help us think for ourselves. Knowledge beyond what is academic and professional is the real education. So there are so many thoughts that I wish to share with all you young people. Most of all, in spite of the pandemic and all what you have said, I do believe that the future ahead of you in the India of today and tomorrow will be exciting. There is a growth of economic prosperity, but also a growth of disparity. With the growth of work will also be a growth of responsibility for you architects and planners. So with the spread of high technology, we must not forget the importance of low technology in a country such as ours. After all, design is a process. India is now a nation of young people like all of you. Your aspirations and dreams are naturally different from the older generation. The next few decades will involve many changes in the physical look and feel of our cities. Thus, buildings will need to be built for the new patterns of behavior of the young. There is also a huge growth in infrastructure, new roads to be constructed, new bridges, ports, stations, airports, the supply of delivery of power and water, the problems of sewage and waste will all need to be addressed. However, new and creative ways of tackling this growth without destroying the physical and natural environment that already exists will be your challenge. 
There are many examples of public-private partnership in various cities of the world and how communities have been active stakeholders, active stakeholders in determining the course of a city's growth while preserving what has gone before in creative and relevant ways. The world is in a continuous state of flux today. While the aim is to help us all steer our way through this pa pandemic, it is also a golden opportunity for us to rethink and reassess the past and perhaps work towards a more just and equitable future. We call architecture the mother of all arts. It is so crucial to ensure a broad-based education, which will include the humanities and other sciences. I'm happy to see that the new national education policy includes elective courses, both professional elective and open elective. I certainly believe that the diversity of my practice in the Indian landscape is because of the broad and diverse education that I was exposed to. In India, our lives are intertwined with our history, geography, culture, architecture. We are almost as big as Europe without Russia. It has a multiplicity of civilizations within it, many countries in one, as one of the young speakers mentioned. So the solutions and answers will be complex and many. We need new and relevant long-term strategies to learn from the situation today and plan the way forward. So the time of the pandemic and its effect has given us some time to reflect and think about our own actions and goals. We need agency, the capacity of individuals to act independently and make free choices. We can only prioritize sustainability and thus nature when we redefine our lives and thoughts. We need to discuss and debate, but always with hope. Architecture-like civilization is dynamic and evolving. While exciting architecture is being built all over the world and thus expanding the vocabulary of contemporary architecture, you architects in India have to find your balance in design, enabling you to be part of the new and creative experiments ahead, as well as be part of what has gone before. You work in a world of computer-aided design with digital design technology, you need to create include all the creative ideas in your practice because creativity flourishes when new ways of looking at the same problem are brought together. When people with different backgrounds, training and experience work together, talking about collaboration, which again, one of you mentioned, bring together their perspectives. So I personally believe that an inclusive practice that spans our diverse population, be it economic or cultural, provides us with great satisfaction. Therefore, the motivation for inclusion and diversity should come not only from the desire to create a just society, but because it leads to better and more powerful creative processes and solutions. I have always been optimistic that there are great young architects in our country today. And I'm sure that all of you will take India onto a world map of architecture. I have no doubt about it. We should also remember that half our population's needs are very severe. And being an architect cannot be just for the rich and famous. Our responsibility should also be to build in the rural areas and in smaller towns and for people who are less privileged than us. I hope that when history books look back at the first few decades of the 21st century, they will find an architecture that all of you would have done and built that responded to the wonderful traditions of India combined with the needs of its people. I want to end with a quote from Arundhati Roy. Of course, she's an author. She's also an architect. She was an activist. And she says, it is connected with the pandemic, but I think it gives a very strong message for how we have to go ahead in our lives. Historically, pandemics have forced humans to break with the past and imagine their world anew. This one is no different. It is a portal, a gateway between one world and the next. We can choose to walk through it, dragging the carcasses of our prejudice and hatred, our avarice, our data banks, and our dead ideas, our dead rivers, and smoky skies behind us. Or we can walk through lightly with little luggage, ready to imagine another world and ready to fight for it. And that's what I hope 
all of you young people are going to do in the very, very wonderful future that I really do believe that all of you will make for yourselves. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Brinda. And now to our last speaker, Habib Khan, who's a multifaceted architect. He has trained in India and the US. Uh, after working for some time in the US, he returned to India to start his own practice in 1990 in Nagpur. Uh, this practice, uh, Smita and Habib Khan Architects, has received many awards winning recognition in India and overseas. He's also a teacher and the current director at Priyadarshini Institute of Architecture and Design Studies in Nagpur, and is on the advisory board of Lokmanya Tilak Institute of Architecture and Design Studies in Navi Mumbai. He's a frequent speaker and keynote speaker at architecture conferences in India and abroad. He's a painter who has had public exhibitions of his work, writes poetry and composes music, including the theme song adopted by the Beti Bachao, Beti Badhao uh, campaign. And significantly for today's discussion, he is the current president of the Council of Architecture. And I must uh, appreciate the fact that he is here because in the past, it's been very difficult to get uh, pre the council presidents to participate in discussions like this. So I see Habib as, uh, as the voice of change. Habib. Hi, everyone. Good evening. Thank you, Prem. Uh, Kirti, Brinda, my fellow panelists, young architects, would-be architects. It's a pleasure to be amongst you all. And the, the drawback, uh, that the last speaker has is almost all the points that I wanted to cover have been covered. Uh, nevertheless, council is a, uh, 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 in fact, I was just wondering what Brinda just said, uh, exactly were, were my words that I was going to speak, but you've put it so very articulate uh, in, a, in an articulate manner that you know I couldn't have put it probably better. Council of Architecture uh, is a statutory uh, body constituted under the Architects Act 1972, which regulates profession and education. And uh, it has certain limitations, it has certain advantages, uh, which we can discuss in some other forum, probably if we have time. Uh, but the, the, I've been listening to all the presentations and the thought processes uh, that you all have, the younger lot, uh, students and young architects. And that proves a point that, I mean, I almost had the same points around uh, which proves uh, the theorem that, I mean, some problems or some issues do exist. Uh, there is definitely a gap between profession and academics. The syllabi definitely needs to change and adapt to the growing challenges of the profession. Uh, profession has gone uh, uh, through rapid changes in the last few decades. And unfortunately, the academia has not been able to uh, keep up the pace with the changes that are happening or that will happen in the, in the profession very soon. The pedagogy needs to reinvent itself to incorporate these changes. And uh, it is too late now. I, I personally feel it is too late uh, to you know, keep bridge that gap. And the academicians and the institutions, the universities and academia in general need to really, really rise up, awaken to this uh, grave situation that they are, uh, they are in. Unfortunately, uh, Institutes are struggling to meet the minimum standards. Uh, as a regulatory authority, we cannot prescribe maximum standards, maximum standards or maximum limits, or the you know, you know parameters are left to each and every individual institution as well as individuals who are involved in the academics to uh, excel. Uh, we want you to very comfortably and conveniently meet the minimum standards so that architectural education uh, is improved, hopefully. Uh, there are some other issues which have been pointed out by the fellow panelists, uh, unemployment, uh, lower salaries, uh, uh, exploitation of internship and so on and on. We are all aware of this. Uh, aspect, uh, these aspects which are plaguing our profession these days. And uh, it is, it is, uh, it is uh, important that in the 
that in the institutions and in the academy, academic fraternity that we all have, we drive towards excellence. The ball stops with them. I was also very, very interested in the presentations that happened, especially the first presentation. I would like to, uh, to, to, to exhort all of you to be positive. You know, uh, the tone of the uh, thought process is more uh, negative, is more on the, on the other side of the fence. And it is time that you are, you are young, the future is yours, and we want you to be positive, we want you to be futuristic, and we want you to look at the profession from a very positive point of view. It's not that problems didn't exist when we were students. It's not that we didn't struggle. It's not that we, uh, we, we were you know, able to meet our needs very, very conveniently, easily, successfully. We had to struggle and uh, the issues were same. The, the magnitude of the issues was same. The nature of the issues would have probably changed over a period of time. And then came the Supreme Court judgment which said anyone can practice architecture and we all thought that the sky has fallen over our head and uh, uh, this is the end of architectural profession. But let me tell you the, uh, the clauses and the uh, existed in the act since 1972, since it was made. And the uh, uh, profession has grown. We are now, uh, I'm happy to inform Prem that we are now 1,27,000 plus registered architects. And in this last year, about 20,000 uh, young architects have registered and uh, about 22, 24,000 students who are going to now come out as architects. When the Architect Act was made, it was a uh, few handful of architects, few hundred architects and a couple of architectural schools, uh, not even 10 included. It's, and uh, now we are uh, 465 and some of them doing very well, some of them not doing very well. And uh, we have a lack, uh, 1, 1. 1.27 lack of architects. So the profession has grown, the awareness in society has grown. And it's not all as dark and murky and bleak as we all make it out to be. It's a very glorious, like Vinda always keeps saying, it's a, it's a very glorious profession. It's a very holistically uh, involved profession wherein uh, you develop as an individual. What we need to do is as students, uh, as a community of students, what you should do, you should concentrate on what you're supposed to do, what you are there for. You, you, have to be, you have to be learning better to become better architects and more importantly, better human beings so that you can contribute to the development of the country. Uncertainties, uh, insecurities will always be there. This is a part of developing uh, as a human being. And you need to meet these challenges, rise up to these challenges. And we all are there, uh, whether in the COA or outside the COA, concerned fraternity of architects who are uh, looking at issues, trying to solve the issues, but you as students should concentrate on what you're supposed to do, which is, which is uh, becoming better architects, learning better and being a holistically developed uh, citizen of my country. And, uh, uh, and you should also look at expanding your horizons. You know, we have to uh, learn that in our institutes, uh, the, the so-called Harvard rogues are no longer needed. Architectural profession has become more collaborative, more horizontally expansive, wherein we are uh, we are looking at uh, uh, lateral infusion of so many allied disciplines into architecture these days. And we need to expand our horizons. We need to look into the rural sector. We need to look into uh, into uh, agro sector, where the government is also uh, funding a lot of. Uh, uh, money into the into these sectors and there are architects who are needed to do this and put uh, the development of these uh, sectors into a proper perspective and architects are trained to do that so we need to look into expanding our horizons where we can be absorbed into meaningful occupation whether it is politics why don't we join politics why don't we uh, why don't we you know become policy makers why don't we become bureaucrats we should we should look at alternative uh, horizons where we can uh, work not only towards our self growth but growth of our profession. So uh, it, it is not uh, uh, something which uh, uh, is a negative or a, or a bleak or a gray situation in front of us. Uh, time changes, situations probably remain same, the intensity varies and we need to be positive and we need to be happy that we are in a, in a profession wherein uh, we are developed more holistically than any other profession that does not teach 
you as many things as an architectural student learns in his journey as a student. And uh, I'll be happy to probably interact more and discuss more, answer questions. And uh, uh, just a brief uh, information in the CUA social, which I'm sure you all are aware of, we are very soon rolling out the student uh, wing, the youth wing. And I would request that someone from NASA could get in touch with me so that we can uh, incorporate their aspirations and uh, their framework into this so that we'll have a wider reach and we'll have a, a, a true uh, representation of the youth in the, in the youth section of the COA social. Uh, thank you so much, Prem, for giving this opportunity. And uh, I'm taking this as a st first stepping stone to uh, interact with the younger crowd in the future of our country. And we'll see how we can incorporate and, and uh, make the council more relevant to the future generation. Thank you. OK, uh, let, let's uh, perhaps start the discussion with uh, one of the more difficult points. Uh, I think uh, if the older I'm uh, the presenter, Brinda, talked about the possibility of a new world, the portal to a new, new world, just cited Arundhati Roy. Uh, Habib expressed some concern about uh, the young, younger presentations perhaps being more negative. Uh, and uh, I think this is perhaps tied to a point that Sagar made that uh, that we uh, sort of romanticize self-actualization to hide the you know what's actually happening. And uh, so there's a question that you know that perhaps there's a gulf between the older members of the profession and the younger members and of uh, how do we actually talk about these genuine issues in a constructive way. So I'd, I'd like to put a question perhaps which I'd like any of the youngsters to, to address is, where do you see the change coming from? Who's going to lead the change? Are you expecting the dominant system to change? Are you hoping that it will change if you articulate your concerns? Uh, sure, sir. Hamza? Yeah. Yeah, I think uh, it has to be, uh, as I also said in my, uh, uh, when I when I spoke, it has to be a, a essentially a bottom up approach coming from grassroots action. So if you don't, if you see something to be changed, you go out there, you change it. And then you tell people, see how, uh, how you have changed it. You say that this is how I've tried to make this change and this is how you should do. So I can give you a very uh, small example. So uh, uh, as part of Multilog Collective, my organization, we are working on this uh, uh, nationwide competition called CR Park Green Community uh, Initiative. Uh, it's, it's a participatory comp competition. Uh, and then uh, together with the citizens and some government stakeholders, we, are, uh, we have invited implementable ideas from uh, designers all across the country. Uh, and then uh, these ideas are going to be implemented. Now, uh, nobody mandated us to do that, but we, uh, we did uh, our engagement for over one year with people. We went out to people. We just had tea with them for one year. Just tea and conversation. Okay, the, the, Hamza, if I can just interject here. I, I know what Multilog has been doing since one of your colleagues there worked in our office also for some time. And you all are doing a great job. I don't doubt that. Uh, the question is, how do you scale it up? Yeah, okay. it has to scale, right? That that is the challenge. I mean, you you can do a great job in one organization. How do you scale it to a systemic level? Yeah. So, so the intent of telling this was that you know once we have started this, now we are in touch with uh, the Aam Aadmi Party MLA there, and then uh, uh, the MLA has assured us that the government will uh, kind of you know help us in scaling that up. Also, one organization called ITDP India, uh, they uh, they had this com this whole initiative as a case study for another nationwide challenge which is which is called the streets for people challenge so one initiative is uh, helping the other uh, uh, um, uh, a more a larger initiative to take place so this is the limited point i, I was trying to make uh, about the uh, you know bottom up action thank you maybe i can uh, quickly okay. jump in sure. if that's all sure. right yeah, yeah. Uh, maybe i'll try and pull that back towards uh, students and, and and young professionals uh, I'm, I'm worried that uh, a lot of this has to be systemic change. Um, I'm worried that uh, architecture students don't really have a strong enough voice 
to be able to say, hey, I am not okay with the way that the internship system runs right now, or I'm not okay with the way that um, the pedagogy is running in our studios. I'm not sure if that voice is strong enough. Uh, and I'm, uh, I think, uh, unfortunately, at this point, at this time, it has to be a strong systemic change from either IA, NASA, uh, COA, et cetera. Uh, why do you expect that change to come from one of the existing bodies? Uh, okay. NASA, this, <laughs> okay, let me put it this way. IA and COA are trapped in their own inertia and they have their limitations. Uh, uh, NASA uh, students are still in a vulnerable situation because they're still at the mercy of their professors. So there's a limit on what they can do. There's a huge mass which is going to dominate the profession's demographics, which is the young professionals. Is there a potential for another organization to emerge out of lateral connections amongst that demographic? Well, that's a that's a good way to look at it. I, I would be worried that it would just become an ocean of, of uh, collectives trying to make change. And then again, you start working in your own silos and doesn't really scale up to the entire community at large. Um, but that being said, I do agree that all of us need to come together at some point and uh, voice out our problems right straight up and uh, figure out if we need to take action to make that happen or if uh, the existing organization need to do that. Uh, same with things like I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a young architect now and it's simple things like how much do you charge and I'm, I, we're always worried about another firm undercutting us. How do you sort of control that, right? So unless you're on the same platform looking out for each other, that's not going to happen. And, and students don't, we don't realize that we can do that for each other right now. Okay. Abhigna, Harish, anything to add there? Uh, I wish, I believe that this, the, if at all we are looking for a change on a huge scale as this, it might start with us as uh, one of you mentioned that the approach should be bottom up and it should start from the grassroots. Maybe this change can be with us because as you put forward, the multitude of a uh, greater component of architects in the future would be people graduating architecture school in this decade between 2021 and 2030. So when we grow up, I guess if at all we start a positive change to happen from now on, maybe as you put forward it, uh, something as an, as an association or an organization, a new one arising that voices concerns that we have, maybe a change might happen. If I am not wrong, NASA India itself started because of a lack of representation because uh, pupils of engineering and other art-based uh, disciplines overshadowed us and we wanted representation. So NASA India started. So there might be a potential for a new organization to emerge. A, a time like this. Okay, Habib Prindala, uh, would you all like to I, I chip would in like on? to kind of yeah. oh, sorry. The, sorry, sorry, uh, sorry, Prindala, please. No, I I would like to say a few things here. The biggest addressing their problems. The biggest problem we all know is, of course, the complexity of the of the of the profession itself, but the fact that we are so undervalued in society. Why is it that lawyers, chartered accountants, doctors and all are valued in a very, very different way? One is because a lot of people don't know what architects really do. Uh, are there are different uh, possibilities that architects can do, you know, as we mentioned, so many diverse things. But as long, the blame lies on us, on the senior professionals in this profession because of the low fees that people are accepting, naturally, when your fees are low, how are you going to pay good salaries to the young, talented people whom we hire? And this is something we've talked about for years and years and years. I personally have tried to work with this. I know this, we talk, I've talked to Habib, the COA. Even in competitions, we have managed to change some things where we say, Please don't have technical and financial aspects. Choose your architect and then decide on the financial aspect. But if you have architects who are willing to work at 1% and 2%, how are we going to pay these young people well? And people might come and say, oh, Prem, Abhi, Brenda, you all are expensive. We're not expensive, but we'll look, at least we look at what COA is recommending and show it to the client. So we have ourselves to blame 
for causing so much hardship to the young people and giving them their poor salaries. The second thing is internships. This is another big problem for me. And I want to share one story. We, we do get interns, but we always pay them. We may not pay them great amounts of money, but we do pay them. And when we, I won, uh, I was collaborating with Billy Chin and Todd Williams. Some of you may have heard of them, the architects from New York. And we were combining working on a, a campus here in Mumbai. That campus won an award with the American Institute of Architects. And they gave their names and my names as equal designers for this award. I got a letter from the American Institute of Architects asking me if I had ever hired interns and not paid them. And I could proudly say, no, that I have not done that. This was the main question that they asked me before they were willing to put our name down. So it has to be that you have to respect them. I know we cannot pay them as much as we would pay a qualified architect. Maybe there has to be differences. We understand we're all struggling. It's not easy. But how can you take free work from a person who is actually doing their internship almost at the end of their um, uh, undergraduate education. So these two things I, I definitely wanted to, to talk about, you know, and very, very clearly. Uh, the, the last thing, of course, is we talk about the integrity and value systems in our profession, which is always questioned today. Now, why does that happen? That happens when earning through actual, correct, good integrity is not possible or doesn't happen. And then temptations come in at every level. So we senior people should have the courage to work with each other and say that this is how we're going to work. We are not going to take up a job less than this. And this is not happening because Maybe there are too many people, each one have their own issues and own problems, but this is the root, as I see, the root of the problem. One of the roots, the root of one of the problems at least. Thank you. Yeah, yeah I, was going, I was going to add the uh, frame here. Uh, I'm not in favor of a new organization. You know, it'll create probably more chaos and create a further divide in our community or fraternity of architects. What we need to do is we need to strengthen the existing ones, whether it's a professional organization or the uh, regulatory authorities like the CUA or the IAA. Uh, we'll, I'll come to that a little later, but talking of the contribution and the non-recognition that the architects have in the society, I always say that we have been making intangible contribution in the society by, you know, uh, while the doctors or uh, chartered accountants are making a tangible contribution in the society, which is very seen if you're well, if you're not keeping well, you go to a doctor, he'll give medicines or, you know, treat you and you feel well and you feel good and the contribution is acknowledged by the society. While the architects, uh, the, the buildings that are being made by architects or the spaces that are being designed by the architects actually continuously, uh, because you live in them 24-7, they continuously uh, affect your mental well-being and, uh, and subsequently the quality of life that you are living. And this uh, acknowledgement is not there in the society because we as architects have failed to tell the society the importance of this uh, intangible contribution that the architects make. And uh, uh, second aspect is why the society does not recognize you is because what have you done for the society? I mean, doctors conduct so many charitable camps, so many uh, you know uh, free treatment camps and so on and on. But what does an architect contribute to the society to, uh, to earn that respect or recognition? is a question that we all need to introspect and, and answer and you know and work towards that but coming to the uh, to the uh, strengthening of the existing uh, organizations uh, i think the both organizations council of architecture and the iia have failed in their duties in the in the past and i have no shame in saying that and i hope uh, some new light would uh, emerge and trying to work out something we need to have uh, more uh, stricter implementation and uh, uh, tighter implementation of the existing laws. Whether they have their teeth, whether they have they are good enough or not is a secondary question. But whatever laws exist, we need to implement them uh, very, very, very in a very, very tight framework. Uh, undercutting, usurping of jobs, and uh, the integrity and the value systems that we have all imbibed in our own selves and in our own practices and profession needs to be really looked into. 
I have been meeting one of the secretaries quite often, uh, concern ministry. And you know, the blunt answer that I got was, if we have uh, set a limit of 1% as architectural consultancy fee, why do architects quote lesser than 1%? Why can you not as a regulatory authority tell your architects in the or your fraternity not to quote? When there will be not a single architect quoting, we will be forced to revise those, uh, uh, those prescribed fees or I will say this is the question, the larger question that we all need to introspect within our own selves and, uh, and have a uh, more, uh, more valuable set of values or more committed, uh, full of integrity. Uh, to, to put it the other way around, we need to have stricter, stricter value systems in our profession. And that yeah. the owner's yeah. life on our senior architects and architects who are already practicing. Yeah, uh, I, uh, moving on from there, and, and Brinda, just to add something to what you said on internships, someone has posted in the chat box of knowing at least eight firms that actually charge money from interns to get a position there. Are you and serious? So, 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 you so, can, so, I mean, a, please let me know, please let me know. We'll, we'll I through. cannot believe that. You know? Uh, they but, charge uh, the intern. <laughs> yes. Yes, I mean they are doing yes. that. Yes. We have been yeah. telling the students, we've been telling the institutions to tell us so that we can write to them and take action against them of professional misconduct. But none of the complaints have come come to us in writing, and that's the sad part. We only talk about it, but let's act on it. That's that's probably because yeah. <clears throat> the great, because great, uh, that, great of, uh, you know, reaching out to authorities, reaching out to the CEO by themselves, uh, with with because. It's already so difficult to find an internship, you know, for a student. We receive so many applications. We we speak to students every day who are just happy to have an internship in the first place, irrespective of whether it's paid or not. So, and then we expect them to sort of voice out uh, and 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 uh, talk about these practices, which which is too much to expect from them. Is is what I think. Yeah, uh, Habib, I wish I would share your optimism about strengthening the existing organization, but I'm afraid I don't. Uh, we need a good forum and COA is uh, a regulator, not a forum. We have to be aware of that. Whereas uh, IIA has unfortunately got into a sort of status quo inertia dominated by a lot of old fogies. And uh, and you can just look at the demographics. Youngsters are not joining IIA at all. That's what uh, I was saying. I mean, let the youngsters so, join and take over the IIA. I mean, they are it, much, much larger in numbers. Well, okay, then, then, uh, <laughs> but then it makes IA a new organization. Then, so whether whether the youngsters do it separately or whether they do it within the IA, there's something that we have to see. But let's if let's I move say on. One thing here, Prem, I, what if, Habib said, which is so important, we've had only one political leader from the architectural fraternity, Pilu Modi, who did the 1972 Act. What Habib said is, how do, how can we get into the public platform so that we have a voice. This is what young people have to really think out of the box a little bit. And whether it's bureaucracy, whether it's politics, whether it's, uh, you know, the gov semi-governmental organizations, but unless they become part of all that, change is very, very difficult because change has to come through yeah. politics and through bureaucracy. Without okay, let, 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 let me use that to move, move on to an... Um, uh, to segue into another subject. And this is tied into uh, some other questions that have been raised by the youngsters. For example, uh, multidisciplinarity that was a point that was mentioned uh, quite a bit. And one of the challenges in, in multidisciplinarity is that you lose sight of your own discipline. And in a sense, it's already happened in architecture. Uh, Brinda, you said uh, uh, society undervalues architects. I think architects undervalue architects much more than society does because they don't even know how to place a value on themselves. Uh, the profession has become self-referential, so it doesn't know how to talk about value in architecture to people who are not architects. So, so there's an there's a issue of the autonomy of the discipline of architecture. Uh, I just would like to uh, put that. How, how do we strengthen that notion of, of how architecture as an autonomous discipline adds value. Um, Anyone? Abhigna, you've been very quiet so far. Let me ask you to uh, come in there on, on your thoughts. 
since you you have talked about having this holistic attitude to life i think so i would like to say that uh, we should be uh, allowed to interact uh, with people outside the profession regarding the profession uh, when asked uh, like when is, when we are asked uh, what defines or what makes you an architect uh, most of us as students would not be able to answer it uh, like um, stage states that thought uh, maybe uh, i agree that the multidisciplinary approach has uh, made us lose the architect in us so yeah i think i think i mean why i'm mean, saying i'm a very strong believer of uh, the thought process that change comes from within your own selves you should not wait why do we wait for a jesus or a moses to come and deliver us so that we need to change our uh, our our thinking process let's start let's begin and then others will help you out i mean why do we look up to authorities regulatory authorities or institutes to deliver us okay if i can intervene with an opinion here i would uh, suggest that arch- architecture tends just tends to be about expressing the architect's idea about what architecture is and does not look sufficiently at meaning that accrues through the process of inhabitation and if you look at architecture from that point of view you have to you have start have to look at the autonomy of architecture as a spatial order and how it facilitates a certain mode of life so uh, i would uh, suggest we start thinking uh, of those those kind of things uh, but i'll come to another question which is again has been raised by uh, the youngsters about uh, having a training that makes you ready for practice ready for the real world you know once you get out and this has always been a controversial uh, uh, question because is the school of architecture does it have its primary obligation to the discipline or to the profession because the two are not the same uh the profession just might be interested in uh, having you know uh, sort of uh, compliant grants who help them do their work so 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 actually an orientation towards a profession might create uh, something very dangerous and that's a very short sighted attitude by which the profession will also undermine itself long run so so what should the school uh, orient itself towards uh, to to make an independent critical thinker who is an architect or or or, or do we uh, orient ourselves towards expectations of the profession um if i can just uh it i think what you said is right right it's important to enable architecture students to eventually understand that they're critical thinkers and 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 professionals who are not just designing and delivering buildings as products but actually putting together environments where people are people are meant to thrive uh but that being said a layer of what how that translates into actual practice and what the limitations can be so we're not saying that a professional practice has to teach us how to make money but it has to make us understand what the limitation of professional practices and how do you separate the critical thinker the critical designer from that right of course our intention at the end of the day as architects is to to propagate that critical thinker within us but how do we practice within the confines of the market within the confines of what uh, briefs that are given to us and how do we navigate through ourselves through that that is the clarity i think should be given Uh, to architecture students and not necessarily how to do the business of design i also personally think prem you know the 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 uh, idea of organized uh, regulated education system for architecture has killed architecture at least its education system and i hope the the, the nep would uh, you know liberate us from this uh, regulatory regime and also the organizational setup that we are all stuck up in so i'm 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 really hoping that uh, the i i the, the new this the existing system uh, that we all are in have not produced uh, exceptional uh, you know outcomes so we need to really think about it okay, where we are going yeah have that that takes us to the the comment that you made saying that as a regulator you can regulate the minimum standard you can't regulate the maximum and uh, that that again is an arguable point because uh for example i have seen where uh, regulation of uh, design disciplines in other parts of the world 
are based on a process where the school first identifies goals by which it can, uh, uh, you know, chart out its own area of excellence. And then the regulatory system actually audits the school against its own goals. And there's just a minimum, uh, the minimum standard is, is just looking at the portfolio of the graduating batch saying, does it you know, qualify to that? But beyond that, the, uh, the focus of the regulation is to challenge the school to live up to its own uh, aims. Uh, so th so that, that works towards provoking excellence rather than, uh, 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 than going with the minimum standards. And, and actually perhaps the problem is that we have the same regulator in India for both education and practice. And regulating practice is actually about that. That's the minimum standards approach. By having the same regulator, we dragged education also into a minimum standards approach. It's a moral crash, it's like crash of crash of yeah. no clash clash of moralities. Yes, yes, it is. So, is is, is there a possibility of change in that? So, at least uh, <laughs> we, we, hope CEO, we, that. <laughs> we hope the NEP will change that. Yes. Okay, and what is the what chart is the CUA drawing to for its movement towards NEP, the new education policy? <laughs> we are working on it, and uh, there are certain things that uh, we cannot discuss in public uh, public fora. But uh, the the implementation of the NEP is going on at the moment, and there are a couple of meetings which have happened with the concerned ministries, and. Uh, where the regulation of education will go to the newer new regulatory authority and council will be setting professional standards as we discussed earlier also frame if you recall and we'll 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 evaluate or you know check the outputs rather than the inputs and the and the whole process of learning uh, but uh, council at the moment is uh, not only architecture uh, COA, but many other councils are going through a situation of flux where we, we also don't know what exactly uh, would be the future roadmap, but we are working on it. We are discussing amongst ourselves as well as we're discussing with the authorities and the concerned ministries. And probably very soon some uh, way would be, would be coming out. So I would not be able to exactly comment what is the you know, future roadmap on this. Okay, uh, let me raise a question, and uh, this is something that Keithi and I have discussed quite a bit, and he referred initially to uh, what we call the Pune Declaration. And this huge gap with curriculum on the, on the one hand, and also what we conventionally define as practice on the other. Between both of these conventional structures of operating, versus the challenge we face today that neither of them address questions of inequality, uh, environmental degradation, climate change. Uh, there's so many other crises uh, and, and nothing is being done to address these questions. And, and uh, what can be done to start moving towards that? What's the obligation both on the schools? What's the obligation on individual practices to start looking towards that? Rinda, can I ask you to respond to that first and then we'll get inputs from the youngsters? Uh, um, I, I don't think that the youngsters are not aware of all the points that you have mentioned. I mean, from what I see, uh, whenever I go or whenever I see their work, they're very conscious of many of the issues that you have mentioned whether it's climate change. No, it's, 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 not the, it's not the issue of them being unaware. They're very aware of it. The problem is the inertia in current curriculum, the inertia in current modes of practice, which is very detached from these issues. You see, the thing is, how do we compare practices? I think it depends on where you, which practice you're joining. I mean, are you going into a practice which is going to be doing uh, uh, film stars residences in Mumbai? Or are you going to be uh, going into a practice which believes in working in rural areas as well? I mean, the thing is the profession is so diverse that for me, there can be never one set of rules or one set of answers to any of your questions. That is the biggest problem we have. We know what a chartered accountant has to do. We know what a specialist doctor has to do. But an architect can do so many things. Architectural practices are so different my practice will be totally different from yours or from Sagar's or from anybody else's. 
So when young people graduate, they must decide. They must study where, which practice, what do they believe in? What is the philosophy? Which practice do they want to join? And why do they want to join that? Maybe for four years or five years, but build up the value system, their value system with the practice that they join. That's how practices used to be in the olden days. Why did you join A or B or C? It's not just convenience. Wherever you get in, you go. So the choice, you know, is, is very, very important because that's where the value system comes. And also, you know, when you graduate from a college, as one of the young men said, um, it could be Stuttgart, it could be another college in Berlin, it could be. Similarly, we can have colleges like that, which have different emphasis on different things. I personally believe that what I look for for young people when they come for training, you know, I, I'm not really concerned whether they know what to do on a site. I'm looking for, for somebody full of energy, full of ideas, thoughts. This is what we look for in the young people. And, and they learn so fast because they want to go to sites and we make sure that that happens. So there are no easy answers to this and there's no single solution to all the questions that are being asked. There are going to be multiple solutions to each question. Yeah, I mean, if you, if you recall, uh, we've had discussions amongst, uh, amongst us when the Pune declaration thing was going on. And uh, uh, I also feel that there is no single solution to this. The onus of responsibility lies with both the professionals as well as the academicians to bridge this gap. Uh, first of all, ideally, think ideally, I feel that there should be no distinction between a practicing architect and an academician or vice versa. It has to be a holistic and that is the main hallmark of architectural learning that I mean, these two have to be together. The, there has to be no distinction, no distinctive line between the two. And unfortunately, for whatever reasons we don't want to go into, the, the divide is increasing by the day. Uh, you know, uh, and uh, I have been, uh, I think in one of the forums where Vinda was also a part of it, we were discussing that how many practicing architects get involved with uh, the teaching processes, how, how many of them contribute to, to learning uh, of an architect and how and vice versa. So this divide has to be reduced and how we don't know, I think we just are trying to understand how this should be done, but the onus of responsibility lies with both. Any of the youngsters would like to weigh in on this? Yeah, um, I, I do agree. I was I was just thinking about what uh, architect Binda Simaya said. And I think one of the most valuable things that I walked away from school was my own design process is what I've built over those five years and the value framework that I ended up adopting as an architect. But I think uh, this, uh, this sense of understanding what is critical to do with a project, with a brief and what is nice to do uh, are things that we end up correlating all the time. It, I think it's we're, we're in 2021 where it's critical to have climate action at the top of your uh, response to any brief, right? Um, but we still, that is not considered a critical uh, response to a brief when you're studying in school. Uh, it's, it's always something nice to have, uh, something that might get you extra points. Uh, but I think that change from uh, these aspects becoming, going from nice to have to critical, I, th I think is very important, at least in the syllabus and, and what what we're propagating in within the studio uh, to our students. Um, let, let me um, get to a, another question, which is on uh, faculty standards. Um, because I think the, the fallacy we uh, uh, tend to operate under in India is that the only people who come to a college to learn are the students. And unlike many other parts of the world, the priority is first making the college a place where the faculty come to learn. And that is the energy that drives student learning. And uh, so, so we don't have enough emphasis on faculty being thinkers, about being researchers, uh, uh, being innovators, whether it is in uh, research and theory or whether it is in practice. Um, how, how do we make a change in the system? And I, I think students are very well aware of this problem. And uh, what, what, firstly, let me ask from the students, what, uh, you know, to what extent do you agree with this as a concern? 
and uh, what uh, challenges can uh, you do you feel you're in a capacity to mount against this and what challenges are very difficult to mount would uh, arish would you like to respond on this yes 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 sure so now that we are addressing the standard of faculty that Uh, work at architecture schools. So, as architect Habib Khan had mentioned, uh, there are a few architects in my city in Bangalore, wherein they take care of the academia and build to contribute back towards it. So, there was this one architect who happened to come to our college for a two-day program, wherein he made us practically analyze what exactly happens in a design process on a professional scale. So, he first. Taught us about stakeholders as to uh, what exactly we have to address on ground, rather than just us being students not addressing those factors. So, if only there are more architects who would will to come back to academia and contribute to us following those lines and becoming similar to them, and we ourselves could contribute back to academia in the future. when it becomes a cycle wherein we work professionally as well contribute back to the younger people could we have a positive change emerging so i think i mean this ball lies with the with the architects i want each and every practicing architect to be involved with a school or something and i did it thinking but i mean uh, the practicing professionals leave uh, you know put the ball in the court of the academicians saying ki you produce some uh, produce an architect who will meet our aspirations but the practicing architects do not want to go to the academia and tell them that this is what we want there has to be a very integral and a very intense to and fro dialogue between the two we as practicing architects expect right. that i mean the academia will produce what we want but we don't want to tell them what we want what are our aspirations this yeah. is what we want uh easier said than done i have to confess <laughs> i have tried that and and then i <laughs> i have been labeled a troublemaker and been asked to keep away so that is the problem of the academy <laughs> yeah you, so, you are disturbing so, their comfort levels yes so so there is a systemic issue and perhaps as a regulator you are in the best position to to deal with it we have really we have realized prem i mean to be honest we realize that uh, our thrust our focus should be on improving the quality of the faculty rather than doing anything else because if the faculty is good if the teachers are good if they are committed if they are there for the for the for, for the interest that they have i, I think half of the problems in addresses uh, half of the problem will be addressed uh, you know by them so we are concentrating on that and this is not a forum to tell what we doing and what we intend to do but uh, that is the main focus of where we should concentrate on development of the faculty that's a very important aspect but i have to say that i enjoy the young people who join my studio i find them bright i find them well rounded i find them so knowledgeable about so many things i don't go into which college they came from or what they learnt but when they come into the studio i mean there might be one or two exceptions but by and large they're quite remarkable and i have seen this you know even when i go out of india in india of course with spa and the other connected things but even out of when i go out of india and i see the post graduate indian students who have come from indian universe indian colleges from india uh making presentations there with with students from china usually <laughs> it's china or one of these countries or south america sometimes the united states they're really really good so i don't want you people to feel undervalued i think after 5 years you have basic i mean you have it you have learned not just from the college you come from a country like india where you're learning all the time from what's around you you're seeing disparity you're seeing inequality you're seeing wealth you're seeing beauty you're seeing horrors you're seeing everything possible and you debate and you discuss that for sure it's part of your lives and that's the richness that you have within you which is such a privilege imagine coming from a country like iceland or something where you just see one thing look what you have as part of your collective knowledge 
just by being in this country and, and traveling and going around, discussing, debating, you know? So there are lots of good things also. That's what I want to tell all of you. Coming to this issue of, you know, uh, the, the training and the internship, I, I, I'm sharing my personal experience. I used to have a lot of trainees. Uh, earlier and then used to say, you know, I, I myself used to say, I don't know what you can't do, you can't do drawing, drafting, you can't do correct sections, you can't do correct sections, and things like that, you know, and views, you can't do it, whatever, X, Y, Z. And then I realized that I'm trying to judge the trainees of the students who have come to uh, learn from me, from my parameters. You know, we have to judge from their parameters. And then the whole perspective changed after that. So, uh, we have to understand, we, we are, uh, this is a very important, uh, very interesting aspect of architectural education, wherein the academia is, uh, is, is sending, uh, sending their students to you for six months so that the interaction increases. And that is your responsibility as a practicing architect. I think I would uh, like to just put the focus on uh, a little bit from the student's side as well and say that it, uh, these students graduate, they, un until they walk into our studios, they're not really sure what they're even ready for. And they're suddenly at the deep end of the pool where uh, there's this expectation from them to have certain quality of drawing, certain quality of understanding of what happens on site. But unless, until they walk into the studio, they're not even aware. And the system probably doesn't prepare them for that. Um, that being said, I, as for the true problem sort of remains, right? How do these how do, the, how do the students find architecture uh, internships in the first place? Is there, uh, is there a process for that? Is, is there, how do they even evaluate what their opportunities are? How do they, uh, what, is, what should be the expectation setting when they, once they walk into a studio? I think these are questions that still trouble students at large. And uh, of course, your, uh, your expectation is to learn how to practice or uh, understand architecture better. But uh, these factors come in and become constraints to uh, eventually have a good internship, which is supposed to be for what, 100, 100 days, six months? Yeah. No, very soon, very soon you'll be having a portal on the council's website wherein you will have all the internships available across the country. That's great. Yeah. That's, that's being rolled out very soon. That's good to hear. I think that should extend also as a, like a, a guideline to firms where... Yes, yes, yes. We're working on that. Firms that, hey, you have to have internships like this, at least. Yes. And also the job vacancies, you know, there are two, uh, two aspects involved in that. Job vacancies as well, uh, availability of positions and also internships with the guidelines. Uh, okay, uh, there, there are many more things that I think we could discuss, but I think it's time we move on to some of the questions that have been raised in the Q&A box. Uh, Katie Ravindran has a question for Habib uh, saying, the payment of interns, can it be legislated? Can it be made mandatory? <laughs> I mean, to tell the professionals to pay a certain amount or a certain fixed scale would be inappropriate. I'm thinking loud because uh, the students are already paying to the institutes a certain amount of fee. And it is also the institute's responsibility to uh, look after that. But nevertheless, we will look into it. That's a suggestion which has come from KT, which is a very valuable suggestion. Let's look into it if we can, uh, you know, if we can do that. I, uh, Prime of AC, I, I don't know if you can do that, but let me see. Let me look into it. Okay. When Katie says uh, it, yeah. At least you can make sure, Habib, that the students don't have to pay the architect. I'm telling you, I'm mean, an open uh, <laughs> invitation. I mean, do let me know which architect has demanded. And <laughs> I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, I heard actually, about it in a couple of forums and uh, otherwise as well, but we have not received any, uh, uh, any, I, any... I, ho I hope uh, uh, Inhaf is making a record of uh, comments that are in the chat box because a couple of people have volunteered to offer data on this. Uh, so I, I would have um, a request as well. I think uh, at least if we at least look at internships as general like labor law, at least propose that, hey, pay the minimum wage uh, that that any sort of skilled work deserves, right? That, that should be the starting point. Um, and then you go wherever you can from there. But uh, there, there has to be that minimum wage understanding that, okay, this is the benchmark. What you do from there is up to you. And that I think has to come as a guideline uh, from some regulatory body. Okay, uh, here's a question from Ujan Ghosh. Uh, it's nice to see very reputed professionals uh, being part of this too. 
Uh, and he says, students have put forward their thoughts and concerns. Now let us, we professional architects, teachers, and regulatory bodies get the solutions. The students cannot do it. Let's not pass on the responsibility to the students. So I'm going to put this question to the students. Do you, do you agree with that assessment or are you, are you really wanting to claim a part of this responsibility? Are you fearful that if the establishment has to do it, it just might be business as usual? I think as students, uh, we have to contribute because at the end it is leading to our growth uh, as, uh, as a society and as architects. I think we should also be a part of the voice. In, in fact, uh, NASA, one of the NASA's vision is to be the voice of the fraternity. I, I, I do agree with what you're saying. Uh, I partly agree with Ujan, uh, Ayo Jan, but uh, uh, the idea is uh, uh, the, 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 you are the council and you, you I mean, council is you and you are the council and similarly for your professional institutes. And uh, I, I, with interaction with all the students and the younger lots like you, I've come to realize that you have, you have more, you know, uh, more substance than probably the so-called uh, senior experienced uh, people and your involvement in the council or in regulating authorities or making frameworks or policies should be welcome. You, you should come forward with your ideas and thought processes only, then the change will happen because whatever we are doing, so-called enlightened individuals or knowledgeable individuals, we're doing it for you because you are the future of our country and our profession. So you should uh, come forward and uh, suggest and we, we should uh, you know, accept your uh, thought processes. That mean that there could just like cross representation between IA and, NAS and uh, COA, you should extend the cross representation to NASA as well and have maybe uh, some sort of representation within the council uh, representing young professionals or young students um, having a voice there. So maybe that means more cross-representation. Cross the other thing is that the first. maximum number of jobs, big jobs, architectural jobs are going to come from the government in the next five to 10 years. And I think the government has a responsibility towards the profession. Hypothetically, what if the government says that we are going to cert float certain competitions where nobody above 35 years can apply? Only young architects can apply, young, young um, uh, offices, young studios, young architects. People like us should not be allowed to apply to those. They are not doing that. They are the same old people getting everything. They have to open up because these are the maximum amount of construction is going to come from government jobs, from, in, from universities, from institutes of technology, institutes of management, from different types of schools, from bridges, uh, different types of infrastructure work, airports, the dozens of stations coming up, airports coming up. We must get the government to say some of the smaller stations, some of the smaller airports, some of the smaller buildings. Give young, make it only for the youth, for the young people. I think that will open up a huge amount of work for them. You and will eliminate it. all of everyone else from trying for those projects. Yes, you nailed it. Actually, we'll be happy to, to know that uh, we are opening up a TRC in Bangalore, Council COA TRC, Teachers the Research Cell. And we have been given a land of two acres by the Bangalore University. And we are floating a competition which is only for architects up to the age of 40. And the jury members would be only up to the age of 50. So we were, <laughs> very soon we will. We'll, yeah. we'll, so you're yeah. starting, but the big volume of work is yeah, going yeah. to come from the, from the government. I mean, does anyone have a statistic how much of architectural work is government and how much is private? It's mind boggling. What is it? What is it? Does anyone know? Prem, do you have any idea? No, I, I don't know. Abhi, you said it's mind boggling. <laughs> I, I so wouldn't be able to quote exact figures, but I can say government is the by far the largest uh, uh, agency which pumps in money into the infrastructure and architecture yeah. sector. So all the young people are looking at the crumbs that are left over. Absolutely. So that's why, that's the frustration. That has to stop. So it has, the government has to address this. It's got to be, the government has to encourage young architects to get new work. 
I've been saying this over and over again, and I really think that's most important. Okay, uh, there's a question from Shubhada Chapekar, who says, why does one expect something from organizations? After all, organizations are made up of people. Each of us could be those people. One has to just do what is right and everything usually works out in the end. So again, let me pose this to, to the younger lot. Uh, do you agree with that? Do you, uh, while there's no doubt a lot depends on individual action, we won't deny that. Is there also a need for organizations and what kind of organizations are you looking for? Hamza, you've been quiet for a bit. Can I ask you to come in on that? Uh, hi, Prem. I've been having a little uh, connection trouble. So if you could repeat that uh, question, the last bit, especially, I missed some of it. Uh, why does one expect something from organizations? Because after all, they're made up of people. So the question is, do we depend on individual organization, uh, individual action, which no doubt is needed? But what do we want from organizations? Do we want anything from them? And what kind of organizations are we wanting? Obviously, yeah, uh, organizations are always better because, you know, it's, it's multiple people who are uh, collaborating and working together for a common cause, and then everyone can leverage each other's strengths. So building on each other's strengths is something that, you know, uh, organize, an organization has an edge of, uh, when you talk about an individual as opposed to an organization, not to say that individual action is not important. So yeah, that is very much important. But the problem here is uh, like in our, in, in our ecosystem, the startup and entrepreneurship ecosystem is still very in its infancy, especially in the uh, domain of architecture and urbanism. So uh, uh, even if there is an organization who wants to do something, and we know for a fact that uh, collective action will be uh, better than individual action, but then the, the, the ecosystem needs to be there in a way that it is sustainable, financially sustainable and sustainable in all other ways. So yeah, that's, that's, that's there. Okay, there's a question from Romy Khosla who's asked, why should a person who has graduated in architecture assume that they can practice? The gate to let them in is missing. And uh, I think this is an important one in the Indian context, and it relates to the whole problem of internship also that we've been talking about. Because in uh, many parts of the world, there is no mandatory internship as part of education. You complete your degree, you get a job, you have to work for a certain time period, like two or three years, and at the end of it, you sit for a licensing exam. And that licensing exam is aimed at setting the safety thresholds rather than uh, design excellence. And therefore they believe that the schools focus on the idea of excellence and then the, the two, three years of experience and the licensing exam results a practical part of it. Absolutely is that a agreed. system we should? Absolutely agreed with uh, Romy and you bring. And we're working on it, you're aware of it, we're working towards it, we're trying to bring it in the amendments. There is, there is opposition from certain quarters, uh, certain sec sections of people, but I think we'll be able to convince, uh, convince them about this. It's, it's, it's the only viable option at the moment to improve and to arrive at excellence, improve the profession as well as academics. What, what, what do the students feel? Would you like to do away with this idea of internship and have this process of experiencing and then a licensing exam? Uh, so Which? I think, yeah, so I think this is in, along the lines of the system that is existing as laid down by RIBA. So now that they have three parts that they could complete at any part of any point of time within a stipulated five year period or so that they could take up even one or more than one year of internship as long as they complete their uh, examination at the end, which guarantees them their licensure they could work as interns or as apprentices in a firm of their choice uh, and then qualify the examination to become licensed architects. I think it can be implemented, but just that when we are undergoing internships, there again arises a problem of being not paid for the kind of job that people do and that uh, students have to pay certain firms in order to get internships. So when factors like these exist, so how can students then 
actively come forward to work and firms to get the experience that they need so that remains a question yeah that that is a that is a problem which we discussed separately and it does need to be addressed but the question is would you prefer a system which did away with this mandatory internships as part of the degree granting process uh if i can quickly add in i think although yeah it would make sense not to reinvent the wheel and maybe adopt a system like viva does has uh also uh, i do know for a fact that architecture if if you go to a private college is quite an expensive course and now we introduce another layer of of external examinations and let's not forget re- being a part of viva is quite expensive you pay your 600 pounds uh if i'm not wrong and plus you have the examination fees so you are not just we are creating another layer of uh expenses for the students who already go through quite a bit so i think it's just not that it's an not that we shouldn't do it for that reason but we should be cognizant of that fact as well it has to work well for our students students coming from varied backgrounds students who don't necessarily should be spending more now to uh prove themselves as architects so in that case you are assuming so you 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 are assuming there will be another layer expensive layer you are assuming that <laughs> it's something that we should be cognizant of is my point that being said like for example the ecosystem that reeva has created the the kind of support they give with simple things like okay you go online you're a member you find uh, contracts that you can use for your projects you have a chart that that explains how you run a project from start to end you have res- other resources that are available these these are things that are very uh, valuable and i think it would be great to have a similar ecosystem here in india not you'll have five volumes and, sorry you'll very soon have five five volumes <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> three of them are done we are working on two of them and very soon we'll be releasing them it's a comprehensive professional conduct manual right from everything right from start to end uh, but i mean see let, let let us understand one thing that uh, i totally agree with the point that was initially raised that just being a graduate architect does not entitle you to practice this is a thought process that we need to imbibe in us and we need to understand and we need to take the onus and responsibility and authorship of the works that we do and uh, uh, because uh, i mean this is an independent debate probably which will need a couple of hours to discuss and uh, and assimilate various few points but we feel that this is the the most viable way to improve excellence in both uh, profession and academic uh keerthi walson has said that clients won't approach younger firms uh, they believe that younger tier people are not talented and not experienced but without the client they don't get an experience and what can we do about that yes sir vishesh sir too uh well well perhaps one way out and uh, we could lobby with the government as a major promoter of buildings is is the idea of two stage competitions uh where the first stage is just an idea based competition and when the winner is selected on that basis if they don't have the necessary experience they, they are asked to uh uh collaborate with with uh, another firm that does have the experience so that the project can be implemented yeah, absolutely okay uh, it's been an exciting discussion and uh, one would love to carry on but we've already crossed uh, our time limit and uh, perhaps what i'll do uh, is just take a little more time and ask for a, a short uh, closing comment from everyone and perhaps we'll go in reverse order this time so abib if you if you would like to just summarize some view points <laughs> so. no let us let us first of all understand that uh, there are issues which exist which we need to address not only with the with the younger uh, lot in our fraternity but uh, overall profession in general we need to address these points we need to have a stronger value system which is based on more of integrity and the commitment rather than anything else uh, we should look at longer goals not short term gains and uh, let us work towards an ideal platform wherein the gap between the profession and academics does not exist let us minimize regulation as much as possible let us concentrate on the improvement of quality of teaching uh, 
uh, in the faculty that exists in our architectural institutions. And uh, let us also look towards change within our own selves, wherein we are not looking at someone else to deliver. Someone, when there's a change amongst uh, a larger, uh, larger group of people, uh, all of all things fall in place. And uh, uh, lastly, uh, we should all as students look forward to a bright and a rosy future and uh, uh, being, and you should feel fortunate to, to be a part of such a glorious and a holistic profession. And uh, we should always imbibe positivity rather than get swayed by negativity, which is very easy to, uh, you know, which is very easily popularized uh, in the social media these days. Uh, let us think analytically and let us be, uh, be more self-introspecting. Let us have our opinions by our own thought processes rather than get swayed by what happens elsewhere. And I think uh, the, more, the main effort of our, all of us should be to become better human beings and the, in the process you'll become better architects and you will be able to contribute meaningfully to our country's development and take it to the next level to lead the world. Thank you so much for listening to me and listening to my thoughts and inviting me on this one. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Habib. Prinda? I think like Habib said that uh, I had said what he was planning to say. I think he has covered everything now. Just want to thank Kirti and Prem, you and Habib and all of you young, talented people for, for sharing your thoughts and ideas. I believe that we need to learn all the time and I'm sure I've learned a lot today as well. Thank you. Sagar? Yes, uh, I, I, this is really great. I think uh, change starts from conversation and, and this is uh, proof of that and representation as well to the fact that we have some very senior architects from the country and uh, Habib Khan from COA. And I don't think such discussion happens. Um, and, and this is proof enough that change is, is imminent. And I, I think it's the balance of systemic change and individual change. And I hope to see that from all of us. Thank you, Hamza. Uh, yeah, uh, so this has been one uh, enlightening discussion and I have also uh, uh, got to learn a lot about uh, a lot of systemic processes that we have talked about here. And uh, as, as a young professional, I want to reach out to all the young people present in this forum. Uh, let's collaborate more. Let's build together more. Let's lift each other up together. And uh, uh, that way we are going to uh, make a long-term change. And also uh, to the experience uh, uh, experts uh, like yourself, Pem, sir, you have been uh, uh, you have been uh, interacting with us in the past as well. And uh, we would need uh, mentorship from uh, experts like you. So let's keep that connect uh, uh, going on. And yeah, yeah, this is all I have to say. Thank you. Okay, Harish. Uh, so I first wish to extend my gratitude to Indian Habitat Forum for having initiated a conversation as this in the first place. I only wish such discussions about what exactly needs to change and what exactly has to happen in the future uh, takes place more often and frequent. So I wish as uh, some of you eminent architects and professionals spoke, change begins with ourselves. And I think it is for the student body to also, because now we are going to be the largest proportion of professionals in the future, have to kind of imbibe in ourselves that we are the change that we wish to see. So thanks again. And it was indeed an honor to be on the same panel with people like architect Brenda Somaya and architect Habib Khan and you, sir, architect Prem. So thanks so much for the opportunity again. Avigna. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank everyone here. Uh, it is quite nerve wracking to talk amongst all the prominent architects of the country. Uh, along with which I would say that, yeah, uh, change has to come from end, uh, every individual, but to be channelized together. And that's when we'll see great things happen in the fraternity and in the future. Thank you. Okay, uh, before I hand over to Kirti for the final words on the seminar, I will use the privilege of being the anchor for the last few comments. 
Uh, I think it's great this uh, conversation happened. We might not have really solved any uh, problems, but uh, it, it proves the urgency of continuing this conversation. And I think a dialogue across generations hasn't happened enough. Uh, uh, we've had a situation where the, the young people, you know, think these, these old fogies are just sort of preserving their comfort zone and, uh, you know, they're not willing to move out and make way for a new world. Um, the old people uh, tend to talk down to the young people and feel they can preach to them. Uh, but we often see a little too much of those. And uh, I remember in the Pune Declaration discussions, and it was nice, listen, you know, we actually had some sessions where we just had to listen to the young. And there was one young girl who, who said to me, how do you have the arrogance to assume that we will get our fulfillment from the way that you see the world? So, so I think we, we have to realize that, that there are these differing perceptions and uh, I'd just like to end by citing something that a, a business thinker called Roger Martin wrote where he, he, he called it opposable minds. And he said, uh, you know, humans are, uh, have the power because we have opposable thumbs that uh, our, our thumb can oppose the action of the other fingers and therefore that allows us to grip a tool and extend our capabilities. And he said the richness of change, the resilience of uh, human action comes when you have opposable minds. So that you have two opposing minds who can come together to grasp a new possibility. And uh, perhaps that's what we need to aim for more such dialogues between the, the young and the old. It's great that CUA Social is starting a, a young people's forum and uh, we really should build on initiatives like that. And uh, people like the three of us and also uh, the, you know, the three old fogies on the group and plus many of the senior professionals who have been commenting uh, need to uh, sort of offer themselves as, uh, as resources for this kind of dialogue, uh, continued dialogue. And I thank Inhaf and NASA for making this possible. It's a great first start and I hope it continues. I have a small request before, I mean, before Kirti takes over. Uh, I would like you guys to share the proceedings of this or recording of this with me so that not only I'm accountable to whatever I have said, but we'll treat it as a base paper uh, to, you know, roll out the usual that we are doing right now. So kindly share the proceedings with me. I'll be grateful. What are you, Kirti? Uh... Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. And I think I'll come back to thank you part a little later. Let me come back on a few comments which I would like to make. Uh, the large number of things said, very beautifully said all, as well. But there are four words which, which, which stuck with me. And I want to come back on that. One is the future of the country. Second word which I heard was alienation. Third word is the disconnect. And the fourth word is bottom up. And I, I know this is, this is probably what I think should have started with, but I think you know, I'm, 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 I'm glad at least I'm coming at the end of this. And all of this in the context of built environment, because that is architect's business. Let's go back to future of the country first. And when we talk about the future of the country, because we are architects, we're talking about cities and villages. Where are we in terms of our cities? And let me give you just a simple example so that you know, we understand the gravity of the situation we are in. We, are, we, we, are, we, we have Mumbai, wealth capital of the country, more than 50% of the people live in slums. And I'm talking about not anything else. I'm talking about the shelter part, something that we are concerned with as, as built environment people. Look at Delhi is the capital of, of uh, a political capital. Its air is so bad that, you know, I think, you know, high court, you know, I think, you know, passes judgment that this is not a livable city. We have a religious capital in, in Varanasi. Ganga Maya is so polluted, we require a whole ministry to do that. Now, this is the urban scene in the context. 
Look at the rural scene. And let's go back to the future of the country. We know very well, not, and I think, you know, there is just no mechanism through which the settlement part of 6,38,000 villages is looked at. And this is just quickly future of the country. Let me come back to alienation part. And this alienation is both. This is sectorial alienation as well as societal alienation. Let's look at uh, societal alienation. I think I'll give you an example. This country built 30 million houses under Indira Avas Yojana in the villages. Architects don't even know such a project existed. Forget about past. This country currently is building 30 million houses in the villages for the homeless and poorly uh, housed people. 11 million are completed. And this is housing. Are architects aware of what is happening? Are they asking question, what kind of housing is taking place? Are they questioning in terms of what is happening? It was a huge investment which is taking place. Let's go back to urban, because the rural is not an architect's domain. Let's go back to urban. Country at the moment is building 20 million houses in cities, urban areas. And these 20 million houses will ultimately determine the quality of landscape you have in the cities. The silver, silver line. Question is, are architects concerned about what is happening? Are they asking questions? Are they asking, you know, essentially, I think, getting involved in doing anything? And I'm asking this question to Habib Saab also in terms of association. What are we doing? These are the kind of ways in which country is being built. These are the examples of alienation. These are the example of complete disconnect. And this is something where we are not looking at bottom up, bottom up at all. Because, you know, it's not only issue of slums. If you really look at the, at the, the deficit of housing, 80% of the deficit in this country is described as overcrowd. Do we have a role in terms of you know, looking at the whole, 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 whole situation? Forget about that. Look at the architect's own operating environment. Look at the building bylaws. They've been created to kind of destroy creativity. What are we doing? Look at the, the, the regulatory framework, the building permission system. You know, I think, you know, how crap and how watched up it is. So the question is, if you are really talking about uh, younger people, if you're talking about New generation, if you're talking about, you know, I think uh, 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 country's future, we've got to kind of look at our education. What are we doing? Whom are we training? And in my understanding, I go on saying this for the last two years or see, that what we need to do is to really kind of take next 30 year horizon in the context of human settlement. We will have something like 840 million people living in our cities by 2050. And I think you know, our cities just do not have the ability, they are not equipped to kind of handle these pressures. And we've got to kind of prepare a whole generation of professionals who can look at that. At the same time, even if you have 800 million people in the cities, villages are not going to empty out. You're going to have something like 800 million people in the villages. What is going to happen to this, this settlement? How are people going to, to, to live? What kind of, you know, I think, you know, conditionality is going to exist? So this is the kind of scenario that I see. Education could never be, I think, bracketed into a time horizon of 30 years. But I think this is a time of major crisis. This is a time where, where we've got to kind of concentrate uh, let me kind of give a last little kind of thing on this. I remember a very interesting uh, keynote speech that uh, Ramesh Thapar, one of the uh, country's earlier public intellectual, gave at a conference at NID many, many years ago that was on development, design and development. And he said it very beautifully. He said, waves of vulgarity are invading our cities. And he said, I don't even know what is the role of a good architect, a good designer. 
is the role of the architect is to kind of build one beautiful building among 99 ugly or the role of the architect is to sensitize the society so those 99 ugly buildings do not come up and that ugliness is talking about you know this uh, this is not only in terms of aesthetical ugliness that is in terms of poverty this is in terms of pollution this is in terms of inequality this is in, in terms of climate change this is in terms of the water crisis and and then this is in terms of exclusion and i personally feel it's very very important that the young generation of architects and as 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 hadith sahab rightly said issue is not only become a good professional issue is to become good human being and that means becoming a good citizen as well and that for if you are a privileged if this is the kind of education you have is absolutely important that you have this concern imbibed this concern brought to you in the con in, in the context of education that said let me kind of uh, thank you uh, prem for helping put this webinar together uh, it has been very sensitively conducted educative inspiring it was obviously forward looking and it was a very very thoughtful debate so thank you very very much i'm very grateful to nasa for agreeing to partner this event and uh, they have been very helpful uh, very cooperative and uh, very enthused from the very beginning so nasa entire organization very very grateful i must thank the entire panel habib saab uh, binda ji uh, 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 uh uh hamzula abdullah sorry sagar and harish and abigna uh, uh for your participation for your time and of course before we end this i must you know kind of uh, thank my colleagues and the studio in half uh, who have been kind of working behind the scene and making this possible uh, making it successful all the time so thank you radhika elika shimul uh druti uh and 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 neeta thank you very much so very many thanks for your time prem uh very many thanks uh uh, uh binda ji and many many thanks and you know, i think you know khan saab for your time and uh as very educative for us uh and uh, uh, uh i'm very serious uh, prem we will take up this suggestion of yours we have been thinking about this not only this we would try and kind of work on a series of dialogues of this nature so that you know we could we could take this somewhere there's there's a great need to discuss and discuss it uh, at different forums and in different contexts so thank you very much thank you thank you prem thank you habib saab thank you thanks a lot thank you brinda ji thank you thank you all young people thank you yes. very much very very nice thank you